get the lights on behind me. It's great. Yeah. Uh, and, and in general, there's just so many different great uh, contributions. Uh, and I just really want to reemphasize what we can all do uh, to get that. Uh, anybody have a punch tag on them right now? I'd love to see you. Uh, raise up if you've got one of your punch tags. Great. All right. Uh, so if you don't know, if it's something that hasn't come across your, your desk, punch tag. How much is that uh, punch tag, Mr. John? John, how much is the punch tag? 30 bucks. And what's it get you? How many punches? All the way around. $25 gets you 30 punches. Put them on the spot. Now, right? So $25 gets you 30, uh, 30 punches of value. That's great value. But you wouldn't want to do it the other way. Why don't you buy, pay, 20, uh, pay $30 and you just pay five punches. So again, you get five free punches, but it's a great way to also contribute toward your Paul Harris, uh, uh, toward your, uh, excuse me, toward the Rotary Foundation and thus your Paul Harris. So just wanted to, to touch on that real quick and kind of go down a couple of different things. Yes, go ahead, Jerry. When we do that $25, does it count towards every Rotarian every year? Yes, so every Rotarian every year is something that we were trying to thrive for. Uh, we're always looking to do, but if every, uh, if every Rotarian contributes $25 to the Rotary Foundation, the club gets recognized as every Rotarian every year for funding. So that is a great question, and thank you for, for doing that. The next level above that is a $100 level, and I am blanking on what that's called. Sustaining member. Sustaining member, member. thank you. That's why I've got Jerry here, and usually others, because we know I'm not gonna remember this stuff on the spot, so. Uh, again, foundation contribution, we really appreciate everybody's uh, uh, efforts on that, and we've had some, some great responses this year. Toward the end of the year, we're gonna have a, a, a regional, uh, the district foundation dinner, and that's gonna be a, a good way that we can all recognize uh, what folks have done and some of the great efforts that have been made forward with the foundation. Okay, with that, we do, we are not gonna have a Paul Harris Award recognition. I don't have uh, the pins with me. I think Nate has those. So we're gonna move on to our lead. Uh, before I move on to the lead program, I do wanna make uh, one announcement, a couple announcements. So uh, we've got Megan coming down. And if, you, and if you'd like to speak on two fronts, Megan's going to touch base on uh, both the social and the service. Okay. And the service. Of course, she's going to run away. So we have a social tomorrow, and here she comes to talk about both of those social and right. service. Social. Good morning, fellow Rotarians. Good morning. Uh, um, just wanted to uh, give a friendly reminder about tomorrow's social. I know there's some things happening around 520, um, but our social is tomorrow at around 4.30 at Matchless Brewing down in Tumwater by the airport. Uh, they do have a television there, so if you're just a diehard Seahawks fan and just don't want to miss it, there will be a TV there and we will definitely be watching it. Um, I also just wanted to uh, give a shout out to Dr. Matthew Heidi of Tanas Chiropractic is going to be sponsoring some cold cut sandwiches and sides for tomorrow social. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
video. So uh, this morning we have a candidate for Olympia City Council position number three. And according to the Thurston County Auditor's website, the uh, Olympia City Council appoints a city manager to oversee the day-to-day -day affairs of the city. The council conducts the city's legislative and policy making, and all council members are elected. Uh, I'd like to note that council members are elected currently at large and not by district or ward, as they are in some areas. The position is considered a nonpartisan office. Uh, position number three, however, has no incumbent, and so Danny McGrone is facing Matt Goldenberg uh, following a three candidate race in the primary. So those two uh, will want out in the primary. So unfortunately, Matt Goldenberg is unable to join us today due to a last minute work conflict. Uh, a little bit of background about Matt. He is a licensed clinical psychologist and lives in the southeast neighborhood of Olympia with a partner and two children, two cats, and one very large, excited retriever. He is a small business owner and operates a private practice serving a diverse clientele as a therapist. He is also a consultant specializing in intersectional approaches to equity. He teaches both undergraduate and graduate level courses in two higher education institutions here in the town. So uh, we want to acknowledge Matt, and again, unfortunately, he is not here today uh, to join us. But we do have Danny McGrone, who arrived in Olympia in 2004 at Evergreen. So Danny, you kind of start to walk up here. This is your walk on the At Evergreen, she studied science, sustainability, and public policy, and earned a National Science Foundation scholarship. Danny works uh, for the Community, uh, Community Farm Land Trust and currently works for the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. She is active in the community and was involved in the following organizations. Dispute Resolution Center, the Center for Ethical Leadership, the International Institute for uh, Restorative Justice Practices, the Olympia Editorial Board, a podcast called The Olympia Standard, the Olympia Food Co-op, Sustainable South Sound, and the Disputes Estuary Restoration so please help me welcome Danny McGraw. So normally we would be doing the kind of the candidate, you know, trade-off questions and it's just Danny today, so not this one. It is Danny here today. So we'll start with a two-minute introduction and then we have a question and then I have some other questions to ask you and we'll just kind of be a little bit more casual about this. I like casual. Do you like casual? Yes. So good. So uh, introductions, put an introduction. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And um, uh, so I'm Danny Madrone, and Doug already uh, took a lot of my introduction there. <laughs> um, I've lived in Olympia for 15 years, and I have been uh, very involved in the community. I've worked on issues around housing and transportation, food systems, climate change, ecosystem recovery, civics, and generally helping our community have better conversations on really tough issues. Uh, as an undergrad at Evergreen, I studied science and sustainability as a National Science Foundation scholar and studied public policy as a Master's of Public Administration student, actually with Doug right here. Um, and um, uh, I currently have a career in Puget Sound Recovery. I work right up the road, so this is actually a very convenient location for me because I can just scoot on into my office at the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. I work for Treaty Tribes, uh, uh, managing Puget Sound Recovery Funds. And um, uh, Olympia is a really special place to me. I've had many people asking me to run for office for a number of years. They say it takes a woman seven, year, seven times to be asked to run for office before she actually does. For me, that's seven years. And uh, I'm finally in a place where I'm able to do that. I'm a, I'm a single mom. My daughter's at an age where I'm able to. I feel like I've given enough time and commitment to the community to really understand the issues and have a wide range of connections. And I'm endorsed by elected officials at every level of government here, uh, from US Congress all the way down to uh, school boards. And uh, that includes the state representatives, uh, uh, Lori Dolan, Beth Dolio, Sam Hunt, Time Enter, and Thurston County Commission, and a majority of the uh, Lithuania City Council, Lacey City Council, and Tumwater City Council. So um, looking forward to whatever questions you have for me. Oh, uh, I guess a bit about my platform. Uh, homelessness is the biggest issue in Olympia. I've been watching uh, how the city has been responding. And one of the things I would really like to bring is some kind of performance measurements. There's a lot of new programs going on uh, at the city of Olympia right now uh, 
that's trying to respond. I'd like to see how we connect those programs and also measure our progress. What are we looking at to know that we're having the kind of impact that we're hoping for? And not just measurements in terms of how many people are we getting off the streets and into permanent housing, but also impact on the community. I think that's really important. I support, I support diverse housing options for people of all income levels in Olympia. Right now, we don't have enough housing for people at area median income. So that's that's a big, significant thing. And um, the environment, better conversations. I think my two minutes might be up. So uh, we do have some questions. And the first question, as, uh, and you kind of touched on this, what are the three most pressing issues facing the city of Olympia and how will you address it? Well, um, you know, I was just talking about homelessness, and I can go into that a little bit more. Um, I've been having a lot of conversations with people who um, who are in the social service sector, who are downtown business owners. I've talked with a lot of people who don't feel like they can come downtown anymore, and I want to make sure that the, I, I know the city is currently going through a, a long process around uh, developing a response plan, and I want to make sure that that plan is uh, inclusive of the needs of everybody who shares Olympia as community. And as I was talking about before, talking about performance measurements um, and making sure that we are evaluating the work that we're doing and we're uh, managing what we're doing in an adaptive way so that we're responding to change. And I also, I think, uh, I had a really good conversation with somebody recently and the three words we came up with for what the city of Olympia needs around that is clarity, accountability, and support. Uh, housing is the other issue there, and one thing I really think we need to do for the city of Olympia is update our comprehensive plan. Right now we have value statements around affordability, which is good, but it's not really actionable. I'd like to see an economic analysis of Olympia to determine how many market rate housing units do we need that support people at area median income and above, and then take a look at 80% AMI, 60, 40, all the way down to no income, and see how many units, uh, housing units, we need to get on board that's accessible for these different levels, because then we can create a plan around it. Last issue. Last issue, better conversations. Um, uh, some of this is happening in Olympia already in terms of bringing people to a table together to talk across differences. Three minutes at the podium is good and required by law, but I, I want to see more things that we can do to bring people together to talk across differences on difficult issues. So the uh, first question comes from Cameron W. Cameron wrote, I think it's no secret that Olympia has a very serious drug problem. While I can appreciate not wanting to criminalize drug addiction and, and users themselves, as far as I know, it is still illegal to traffic and sell narcotics. As a future member of the of city council, what would, your, what would be your stance on stepping up the enforcement of laws prohibiting the sale and distribution of illegal narcotics, which is openly occurring in, on the streets of downtown Olympia? All right, so that's a good question. One thing that we don't talk about enough is the opioid crisis. And um, in terms of what a city council member can do to step up enforcement, there is a separation of powers there. The city of Olympia, uh, the, the council sets policy and it's up to the city manager to work with the chief of police on figuring out enforcement. And there's a lot of challenges there. I've done a walk along uh, with, and, and a ride along uh, with police officers uh, to see what the, the challenges are there. and. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's acceptable that we're finding a lot of uh, drug paraphernalia in our community and being exposed to the behaviors that come with that. And um, I, 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 I'm not exactly sure what I could do as a council member to step up enforcement except to make sure that we are talking about it in connection with a lot of the other issues in Olympia. Uh, I'm supportive of uh, options for people to get into treatment and a lot of the work that's going on at Thurston County to help people as they enter the criminal justice system to, um, to, to get into some kind of treatment program. So Michelle W. wrote, uh, what is your vision of the ideal downtown Olympia in both look, feel, and focus? Sure, so I'm a big advocate for urban density, which uh, that downtown is the urban area for the county, and I want to see a place that's easy to walk around, to access transit, uh, 
I want to see a lot of bustling local shops. I I personally enjoy the the, the, the businesses that we have down there right now, restaurants, uh, the farmer's market, all of that. Um, I'd like to see it clean and safe. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who feel uncomfortable walking around downtown and others who do, but I want, I want, I'd like to see a family-friendly environment. I have a 12-year-old daughter and sometimes she doesn't feel comfortable downtown. Uh, I think having a really healthy urban waterfront is incredibly important because as people come and, and enjoy the urban area, they can also have a connection to the natural environment. And, um, I, I think uh, downtown Olympia needs to be full of public art and uh, just a place for ev where everyone can feel comfortable, enjoy coming down there and spending your money. So Jeff G. wrote, homelessness has been an issue in our community for many years and in the last 18 months, the crisis has reached unprecedented levels. Most of the local community services are concentrated in downtown Olympia, which creates an uh, efficient environment for service delivery. Recognizing that the homeless population comes from our entire community, how would you engage other local jurisdictions to step up and help the city of Olympia to deal with this crisis? Uh, well, as I said in my introduction, I am endorsed by a majority of the other councils in Lacey and Tumwater, and I have uh, and I have relationships with people at the county level. I think one thing that's really important to understand when working across jurisdictions is that each has a different constituency, and that um, there are certain things that can be done in the city of Olympia that can't be done in Lacey or Tumwater or at the county level. And then there, are, but there are other things that those jurisdictions can bring that their constituents really want to support. So um, in terms of being collaborative and figuring out what can be done in each, uh, in, in, in each area that is supportive of the major focus of the crisis, which is, which is in Olympia, and also uh, doing what can be done in other areas. We, we have people who are becoming homeless in our own communities because of the housing crisis. So working with other jurisdictions to make sure that we're meeting growth management goals is really important. And um, in terms of uh, responding to homelessness, I would like to see what I can do to support other jurisdictions in bringing on more shelter beds throughout the whole area. So continuing the riff on uh, housing, Trudy S. wrote, Olympia has done an outstanding job of investing both in the city and citizen funds to support finding solutions to the homelessness crisis. In the next four years, what do you see uh, the most important role of the city and the city council being in the region to ensure everyone has a safe and healthy home they can afford? Uh, well, I talked a little bit about this in my introduction, but I think the key thing that we need to do is address our comprehensive plan to put targets around the number and types of housing that we need. Because uh, right now it's value statements around affordability. And as we see more housing get built in Olympia, um, a lot of it is market rate, which is a really great thing. We've actually diversified our downtown area by bringing on market rate apartments. But I think when somebody is struggling with their own housing situation and they see housing that, that getting built that isn't accessible to them, it builds up a lot of strain in our community. So in our plan, we can show people that yes, we see your need and we are working towards that here. This is where you are in our plan and these are our steps to build it up. To, to, to building housing for you too, whether that's through incentives or cooperative housing, uh, public housing, um, or anything that needs to be, uh, any, 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 we, we need an all hands on deck approach. And I really want to see more opportunities for ownership too. So the final question comes from Michelle W. And she wrote, if you were only able to address one key area for Olympia, what would that be? <coughs> That would be housing. Uh, we're not going to solve homelessness if we don't have enough housing. It doesn't matter how many transitional or supportive things we do. If there's not an end game of getting a roof over somebody's head where they are safe and stable, then that uh, th that that has got to be what we're working on in terms of a long-term strategy. Uh, I, as a you know, I was a low-income single mom for many years. My daughter and I shared a single bedroom so that I could stay in the area and finish college. We live in a basement apartment that, for many years, that was technically illegal in the city of Olympia, um, and she was actually born in an illegal triplex. So the housing issue is incredibly important to me, and I'm doing much better now. But I don't want to leave my friends behind. I know a lot of people struggling in our community, and I don't want to see them ending up on the streets. And we need to support the people who are already on the streets and find. Please get them housed.
So, a round of applause for you. Why is the radio system important? 
But again, as I highlighted, it, it's the only thing. So we, you know, we, we we send fire trucks, we send medic units out on calls, and sometimes they use hoses, sometimes they use water, sometimes they use band-aids, sometimes they use heart monitors, but every time they use uh, the radio system. And while I don't think any of my uh, law enforcement brothers and sisters are here this morning, it, I think it's even more critical for our law enforcement partner, particularly the Thurston County Sheriff's Office, to realize the level of uh, remote uh, areas we have in our community, both you know, suburban but highly rural areas. And, some of those areas are simply have no coverage under the current system. And so you have singular law enforcement officers out there with no ability to communicate or request backup on the current system. You know, years ago, I heard that there were two major inventions that really changed in law enforcement. The first one, one was the incandescent light bulb, and the second one was the radio system. And the Motorola used to have an ad that said, you can outrun the squad car, but you can't outrun the Motorola. <laughs> um, so this, the replacement of the system is estimated to be uh, $30 million. So why does the replacement cost so much? Well, again, we're talking about not only you know radios in every vehicle on every hip of response uh, personnel, but we're talking about infrastructure. So there are dozens of towers that currently exist, and those will be retrofitted with digital equipment, but there's also uh, additional infrastructure required to improve the footprint. So it will be new towers that have to be constructed. I will say that, again, in trying to find ways to keep the costs manageable, there have been efforts and will continue to be to cooperate with other uh, areas. So, for example, Pierce County and, and the Washington State Patrol have infrastructure that we'll be able to keep back with uh, that will lower some of those costs because it could have been even higher. I can tell you in some of our adjoining counties, that was cost have been in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So, Dan, uh, uh, what the, here, you can see the answer. Uh, so, <laughs> what does the proposition want to do? Right. And I think it is important because of the ballot of language. So many times people just kind of read the summary of the ballot language. And obviously, um, I love all the attorneys in the room, but obviously it was written by attorneys. And so the ballot language can be somewhat complex. And so it quickly calls out two tenths of 1%. But I think it's important to realize that it is an additional one tenth, that we've had the current one tenth since 2002. And that was, uh, again, a voter approved uh, measure back in 2002. And one of the big things that that did is it has provided this longevity of the system that allowed us to go um, the additional 17 years since that was instituted. So again, Proposition 1 seeks to uh, voter approval for an increase of sales and use tax uh, an additional one-tenth of one percent for emergency communication systems and facilities. Can the new funds be used for other things? Um, that's a great question. I think one of the questions that we get sometimes is, well, if you're just putting a new radio system, why not bonds? And so I think that's an important distinction that we need to make is that, number one, bonds have to be covered through property tax, not sales tax, generally speaking. But also what um, bonds would do are only for the capital outlay. And this is the capital piece of this is one important piece. We can't do the rest of it without the capital investment. But once the system is put in, it does require maintenance. It requires repair. And we honestly want to be preparing for the future when there needs to be upgrades to the system so we don't find ourselves in this same uh, predicament you know, 30 years down the road where we have an antiquated system. So I, as referenced, the RCW 82.14, and under that state law, these funds can only be used for the emergency communication system. So if you're worried that it's going to be diverted to parks or something, that is not possible. So what will happen if Proposition 1 is approved? Uh, so if it's approved, almost immediately the process will begin to identify the vendor, um, establish the necessary leases and equipment uh, to start the upgrade process. We've been told that it's up anywhere from a uh, two and a half to three and a half year project to do that upgrade. So this is not something we're gonna see uh, immediate improvements in overnight, but we need to start the process now. Again, we're already behind, and so the fact that it could be three years or more before we see the improvements, that's why it's critical. But it would start almost immediately. It would also allow uh, TCOM to um, start to make the necessary planning elements for the maintenance and infrastructure pieces that will have to go in after the system's up and running. And uh, what will happen if Proposition 1 is rejected? That's a great question. Uh, we are pretty much, uh, I'll be honest, we're back into a corner. This system has to be replaced. And so if this were not to pass, then the really hard conversations come about how else can we fund it? Because not funding it really is not an option if we want to have our public safety personnel uh, continue to serve the community. And so, uh, one of the things that's been discussed is that we may have to come to each of us as public agencies to actually ask for user fees. We've been very fortunate since the early 2000s that we have not, out of our local budgets, had to pay, pay user fees to TCOM. And in order to fund this, when you start doing the math on $30 million, uh, those user fees that would be required would mean that each of us as public agencies, all of the 12 fire agencies, all of the law enforcement agencies, 
uh, the public safety and the community will have to cut back on things so that we pay for this. So it's unfortunately, you know, uh, I believe it's kind of Robert and Peter to pay Paul if we do it that way. So um, you mentioned TCOM. So what is TCOM? That's a great question too. So sometimes there's an identity crisis, just like us being the Lacey Fire District 3, sometimes we have to have that identity crisis about are you city government or are you not. TCOM uh, sometimes has a similar identity crisis. So uh, up until I believe it was 2010, uh, TCOM was actually, the 911 center was uh, a sub in, in county government, but in 2010, uh, they became a standalone nonprofit entity. And so that came with a lot of benefit or value to the way they're governed. It does bring some complexity also to the ways that they are able to fund. And so they are typically relying on other public agencies if they have to go out for things like modern beds or those kinds of things. So it is a standalone, a nonprofit a corporation under Washington state law, but it governs um, a single 911 center. And that's the great thing is that in many communities, they're still going through the process of consolidation. That was a big deal. It's still working through in Pierce County. Not only were they trying to upgrade their infrastructure, but they were trying to bring three or four centers under one roof. And we're very fortunate that we've been under one roof since the 1970s. So that, that, that work has already been done. Thank you, Steve, for the factual bit of information. Um, so it sounds like, it, it, oh yeah, there's factual sheets on your, uh, at the table there. Yeah, please take that. Um, I, it, so it sounds like the radio system and, and upgrading it is pretty important. Yes, I, I would say, and I, again, I don't want to be from that hyperbole. I, I truly believe this is probably the most important singular issue that crosses all uh, disciplines and jurisdictions in the county since, since I've been here for the last 15 years. But uh, this is the single most important piece of public safety uh, going forward. Yeah. So again, as a reminder, it's a 40-year-old system. We're replacing an analog system with a digital system that would improve coverage. It allows for greater efficiency and expansion of the system in the future. It pays for the installation of uh, radio equipment across all jurisdictions here in Thurston County, and then it allows us to manage and operate that out into the future. You know, I asked Kathy, uh, some of you know Kathy, my, my wife, about, about this issue when it first came out, I said, Gee, Kathy, you know, would you vote for this? The replacement of the public safety emergency communication radio system? And she said, well, it sounds pretty important. Yeah, I'd probably vote for this. So I think Kathy's entirely right. This is one of the most important <laughs> things. <laughs> Kathy's always right. Uh, but this is really one of the important things that we can do to ensure that I mean, we are, are safe when we call 911 and responders come, uh, but also to keep our responders safe uh, when they arrive at the scene. So I want to encourage you to one vote. If you're in the city of Olympia, you have council races. If you are in the city of Lacey, you have council races. If you you have council races. And of course, countywide, we have the Port Commission race as well as Proposition 1. I want to encourage you to vote. And when you get to Proposition 1, which will occur after the state initiatives, vote yes, Proposition 1, Christian County. Thank you. All right, let's hear it for Doug and Steve Brooks. Steve Brooks. And just uh, to clarify, one of the things that we like to state with the political forums is that we're always trying to be unbiased. We did uh, put a request out to see if there was anybody who wanted to talk on the other side of the issue for Prop 1. I just wanted to make sure we put that out. Okay, now we're moving into announcements. And if I could have our literacy chair, Lori Carroll, come on up. Let's hear it for Lori. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's October, finally. And you know what's happening in October? Book we'll drive. Yes. We'll drive. Yes. And I already, I got my first two books today. Megan got them from the Amazon wish list. This is an example of a baby board book if you're looking for those. Um, so I'm gonna send out a flyer so people can put it in their offices. And um, I want you to go out and get books. It's all for the South Sound Reading Foundation. It's all for good. And um, it's a contest with Lacey. And last year and the year before we got beat badly. So. This year, we need to step it up. All right, thanks. Yeah. So again, if your heart's in the right spot, you're bringing in books, and many of them to support the children. If you're in a, a Patriots fan like I am, you're sitting there going, hey, I want to beat Bill McGregor real bad. He's in the Lacey Club, so we're going to win and beat them bad. I can't live with him beating me again this year. 
Okay, uh, I do have a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to recognize uh, that if you haven't seen it yet, and I think it just came out yesterday, right? Uh, the District 5020 uh, newsletter uh, featured the Bronx Brews and Bands in yeah. town. A great article up there. Uh, we posted it on our Facebook account. Uh, where it's up on, I think we're going to get it on our website. So take a look at it if you're, uh, who's on Facebook and have, uh, have Light Gateway on there? Great. We should have more hands than that. Who's on Facebook? Let's start with that. Who's awake? <laughs> and we're going to send it out to everybody. I think that, did we send an email out on that one? Great. We're going to blast that out, make sure everybody sees it. But take a look at that, that newsletter because it does feature our club, some good quotes in there, and, and kind of what we were able to do and accomplish with that. Um, so I just wanted to give recognition to Troy for, for helping out and putting that together, uh, as well as uh, Jeff with a lot of different pictures. Is Jeff still here? Yeah. Yeah, you're still here. Wow. Uh, okay, uh, a couple other announcements that I have. Board meeting tonight, 5.30, over at Chicago Title. So we're going to be discussing a couple different issues here, and we'll be, uh, uh, I will report back on that in two weeks, back to the club. Uh, lastly, one of, the, one of our initiatives that we're trying to push is that everybody joins a committee. So I, I've been saying that for since I started in July as president and thought, you know what, let me, let me kind of uh, tweak a couple things and point out who's leading some of these committees and give you a little bit of a flavor. So, um, BBB planning, if you're looking to be involved in that planning committee, uh, that always goes to the incoming president-elect. So uh, uh, we'll have, uh, that'll be Amanda, who's gonna be running BBB next year. So if you're interested in being in that committee, please see Amanda. Foundation, as you always hear from uh, Nate in the mornings. Uh, membership is Shannon, hi Shannon, I saw you coming in. So if you're interested in membership, it's a great committee to be a part of. Club service, Doug Ma, Doug does a great job on so many fronts, but it leads our, our service committee. Um, we have club administration in the back. John, how you doing, where are you? Uh, John, if you want to be involved with club administration, do a lot of work as far as doing setup and, and making sure that the, this meeting runs as smoothly as it does, and basically to make sure that whatever I do to, to interfere with it running smoothly is tampered down as much as possible. Uh, we have uh, literacy, as you heard from Lori. Let's see, let's see Lori, there we go. Um, public relations, we have Troy, if you'd like to be involved with that on the PR side. Uh, we've heard from uh, Grace several times on vocation. If you want to be involved with that, please see Grace. And Youth Services, Nathan, if you want to raise your hand, there he is, I saw him back here. So again, we want to get everybody involved in the committee. We really encourage everybody to be a part of that. Last, uh, we are going to be putting together a committee for the uh, election slate for the 2020-2021 uh, uh, election. So if you're interested in being on that, please see me. And please see me within the next uh, week because I'm going to be putting together that slate uh, promptly. With that said, we are skipping our classification talk and, and we're not going to be doing that this week. But we are going to be moving right into our our fun events. So if I could call our sergeant at arms to the stage. Oh, before I do that, as she's coming, keep coming though. So it takes a little while for, for me to, to, to turn off. I have to say goodbye to our folks at home. So thank you very much. See you later. Bye-bye. Now let's have a